guys and welcome back to my channel. So in today's video we're going to be learning all about the channel tunnel. Now the reason I decided to do this video is because it's actually within my PhD territory and the more I learned about how it was constructed the more fascinated I got and I thought I had to share it with you guys because it was actually geology that made the channel tunnel possible. So for those of you who don't know it's the world's longest marine tunnel and it's built between England and France and so it connects the two and it's about 50 kilometers long and it has shortened the time it takes to obviously travel from England to France to a fraction of the time and it was actually built 30 years ago to this year um, and in a week it will be to this date so on May 6th 1994 they completed the construction of the channel tunnel now this had taken six years to complete but it had actually been in the works for many many centuries even so dating all the way back to the 1800s there's evidence of engineers coming up with kind of complex ideas on how they can bridge the gap between England and France some of which use horse and carriages and had oil lanterns to light the way others were kind of man-made uh, landforms that then were connected by bridges some others were submerged by floats and like a little passage and then the winning idea was actually the tunnel now this was designed to go underneath the sea floor and actually go through the rock strata all the way from England to France, so from Folkestone to Calais. And this is the winning idea. So this actually, they tried to construct this in the 1880s. They then tried again in the 1970s, but due to political, financial, cultural, other issues going on, they it all kind of got stopped. But thousands of metres were actually already drilled. And so they've actually been able to kind of test run a few different methods um, before they actually did the final construction in 1980. Um, so it was in 1980 that an agreement was made between England and France and they could finally officially start the construction and successfully complete the construction. So the big question here is how on earth can a marine tunnel of this size and magnitude actually be constructed? There are so many external factors to take into account. There's the pressure, there's the water, how do you even go about that? And it was all made possible, yes, due to advanced technology, but also because the way the geology is. So let's talk about the geology. So there's a specific layer of strata called the chalk marl formation that is actually what the channel tunnel is drilled through. So they followed this layer all the way from France to England or England to France, whichever way you look at it. And it was this layer that made the whole project feasible because it was structurally stable whereas the layers above and below would have been unstable so this chalk marl is made up of interbedded kind of chalks and marls and for those of you who don't know chalk is literally made out of planktonic skeletons so if we kind of put a magnifying glass on it but a very 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 strong one we'll be able to see amazing micro fossils and nano fossils such as this like the coccolithophores coccolithophores i did not want to pronounce that today <laughs> And marl is more like a kind of clay substance. So you can kind of get an idea for the sort of material we're using. And it doesn't sound all that stable, but the way it's kind of structured above and below other layers makes it stable. And this layer is on average about 45 meters below the seafloor. And it can even get to about 75 meters below the seafloor, which is the deepest depth that the channel tunnel goes to. So you, here you can see a nice diagram of what I'm talking about. So you can kind of see the other layers of rock formations and you can there see the chalk marl that kind of goes all the way from one side to the other and it makes almost like a shallow U. But that poses another question. How did they know where to drill? And this actually comes down to the work that was done previously in the previous channel tunnel kind of construction attempts where they drilled hundreds of boreholes all along the English Channel between England and France to actually work out what the strata does um, all along the way. And here they identified the chalk marl that it was a consistent layer from England to France. And so they were able to follow these boreholes. But the issue with a borehole is it only gives you a small snapshot then and there. So a borehole, for those of you who don't know, is literally a uh, different diameters depending on the need but they'll drill a direct hole all the way down from the surface and they'll then bring that core back up and they kind of lay it out in these big trays and they then will get geologists to assess what the rock type is from top to bottom and they'll then create sedimentary logs where they can see right this is the rock type at this depth then we get to this depth and this is the rock type here this is where it changes so they're able to map 
what they can't see. And this is how we can create those cross sections of the geology. So it's really amazing, but you're still going in blind of what's going on in between. You're kind of inferring the resource or the rock. And it's also how it works within mining or junior mining. They build up a resource by just putting in holes here and there and they build it up blindly and they join the dots. It's almost like a dot to dot exercise, I would say. But in this case, they did do hundreds between the 30 kilometer distance of England and France, and they were able to piece it together and work out roughly where they can drill. So they had these snapshots, but this wasn't enough detail to go off. So they also had people on the front line double checking that the rock around them is the correct strata that they want to be drilling in because they could very easily go off course, a bit too high, a bit too low, and then they'd be in unstable territory, which is not what they would like to do, especially because England and France were drilling at the same time to meet roughly in the middle. So they had to meet with very little margin for error, you know, around two centimeters to two foot could be doable. But if they're off by too much or they, they've made an error either side, then the tunnels wouldn't join and there would be a massive issue, especially because this project cost a fortune. It's one of the most expensive engineering projects worldwide. And so for it then not to meet in the middle and for them to be off uh, would have been quite the setback but luckily that didn't happen and the English side traveled a little bit faster than the French side mainly because the French side had a few more setbacks with regards to faulting and other geological issues that they had to stabilize first but there's an amazing photograph of when they made that breakthrough two years after construction started in the 1990 90 sorry um, where they're breaking through that final bit of rock and you can see the other side and so I think that must have just been a very pinnacle moment and then there was four more years after that of further construction to actually make it like fully constructed so that it could take passengers. But we should just talk about the strata itself for a moment here. If we go back to this geological cross section, it is not a nice horizontal band. You can see it kind of winds and it bends and it moves. And so the channel tunnel had to follow the geology. So it also had to wind, it had to bend, it had to follow to get like through the right layer of rock. So they would have had to be always double checking where they are to make sure that they're going to end up matching with the French side because one meter too much on one side or the other side and they wouldn't be a perfect match in the middle. So it must have been very stressful to kind of keep it accurate, but they managed to do it. So let's get into the design itself a little bit. So it's actually composed of three tunnels. Now you have one going in one direction one going in another direction, but then you actually have a smaller one in the middle, which is the service tunnel. Now this service tunnel had a lot of benefits. So they also drilled this one a little bit first. So this was to almost double check that then the bigger tunnels that they're also drilling are going through the right layer of rock. So it was almost like a trial run and it's slightly smaller in diameter because it doesn't need to take the trains, but it does take kind of work personnel and it's to make sure that everything's running smoothly and it also can act as an emergency tunnel as well. So the service tunnel is about 4.8 meters in diameter and then the larger two main tunnels are in fact 7.6 meters in diameter, which means they could actually take a double decker bus in them if they wanted to. <laughs> So this diagram actually illustrates it very nicely where you can see the three tunnels, so the smaller service tunnel, the two larger main tunnels, and they're also connected by cross passages and piston relief ducts. Now we'll get into those in a second. So there was a key piece of equipment that actually made the channel tunnel possible. Now these were called TBMs, which is an abbreviation of tunnel boring machines. So quite self-explanatory, but they needed quite a few of these and they weighed over 1,300 tons each and they were they were beasts and they could actually drill 3.5 meters an hour which in my opinion is quite efficient considering you're at least 45 meters below the seafloor and you're literally under the sea like it, it's crazy to me to even fathom how this construction project was possible. So let's talk a little bit about the more complexity of the design. So obviously we know there's three tunnels, but then what else is going on? So there's also some crossover tunnels. Now these allow the two main tunnels to cross over with one another so that if one part of the tunnel needs to be serviced, they don't have to stop travel for customers, for trade, for any other purposes. They can just cross over into the other tunnel and basically both share that tunnel for that duration and then cross back over at a later point. So this was a really kind of smart idea to prevent delays and also allow 
um, work to be done if necessary and for the trains to just easily pop over to the other side if necessary. So along with these big crossover tunnels, there are also every 375 meters, a little cross passage. Now these are for emergencies. So these basically mean if there's an issue in either one of the large tunnels, you can get to the service tunnel and then get yourself to safety, either going to the English side or the French side, depending which is closer on your journey. Now these have actually been tested in real life emergencies. So in real emergencies um, on two occasions due to fires. So one was in 1996 and one was in 2008. There then is also piston relief ducts and a cooling system as well. So the piston relief ducts are for ventilation and the cooling relief system is due to these trains don't have anywhere to dissipate their heat. So a lot of friction happens when a train travels and usually trains can kind of dissipate it in the natural atmosphere. However, when you build a tunnel like this, there's nowhere for it to go. There's nothing to dissipate it. So it gets hot and it gets really hot. So they use a cooling system that kind of runs pipes parallel to the trains that keeps things kind of comfortable. So of course, when you drill something on this scale, there's a lot of waste rock. And what do you do with that much excess rock? I mean, it has to go somewhere. And the French side and the English side both had plans for this. So on the French side, they built something called Fon Pignon. And then on the English side, they actually built Samphire Ho, where they added 111 acres of land. And this became a nature reserve, but also it's where they house their cooling plants. So it kind of had a dual purpose and it's just been utilized. So they kind of grew England a little bit. So that's all I got for you guys today. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like and subscribe if you did. Feel free to comment down below any questions you might have or any future videos you'd like me to do or topics you'd like me to address. I'd be happy to do so. But thank you again for watching and hopefully I'll see you next time.